In today's spoiler alert, we look at the film Lincoln. This 2012 historical biopic tells the story of the 16th American president's quest to pass the 13th Constitutional Amendment at a time of civil war and political disunity. It was written by Tony Kushner and Doris Kearns Goodwin and directed by Steven Spielberg. Lincoln stars Daniel Day-Lewis, Sally Field, and David Strathern. It is available to rent in the usual places. Elle and I would be in over our heads as far as historical competency goes, if not for today's special guest. We are joined by John Rodriguez from the podcast Hidden History, an Odyssey Through Time. John, welcome back. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me back. It's always a pleasure. Um, I was here last for Oppenheimer, and now I'm glad to be here for Lincoln. So it's uh, it's great to be back. Yay! <laughs> and if I remember correctly, Oppenheimer was one of our very few educational episodes. <laughs> <laughs> At least you had the one. Out of eight, yeah. Something. So far, it's like one out of 80. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, today you got Lincoln. Yeah. There you go. First impressions. How does everybody feel just vaguely about this movie? I thought it was really good overall, probably because I look at it with a different lens when I watch any historical movie, uh, whatever topic it may be. But this movie, it was done very well, I think. You know, it's Steven Spielberg. He doesn't really disappoint often. And when it first came out, you know, Steven Spielberg's coming out with Lincoln. I wasn't too worried about historical accuracy or, you know, it's a movie, so it happens. things are going to change. But I, I thought it was a really good movie. Chris? For me, I thought it was a little hollow. I don't know what I was expecting going in, but what I got reminded me a lot of the animated movie Anastasia, where everyone is very concerned in their present with the historical significance of what's happening. And I thought that for a movie with characters reacting in real time to what's happening in their present, it seemed too retrospective. It seemed too much that the lens was from the present day looking back instead of just occurring in the moment. I get that actually, um, uh, that that exact view. I understand that because this movie, uh, people also have to remember, it just covers the last four months of his life. So prior to this, uh, to, to the events in this movie, the Civil War had been going on for four years. So there was four years of, uh, of this country being divided and four years of, of, of Lincoln trying to, you know, uh, bring the South and the North together. I understood why they focused on the last four months, you know, the importance of the 13th Amendment. And then uh, obviously the South eventually surrenders and then Lincoln is killed. So that, those were a very important four months, definitely. But for the movie, the, the common movie uh, watcher like you guys, that four month period, it should maybe they should have extended it a little bit uh, further back. But it was already on, what, two hours and a half and they were only covering four months. So uh it's never easy to fit a book into a movie, no matter how hard you try. Yeah, I think I was a little disappointed that it was just such a quick frame of his life, just a snapshot, really. Um, I can understand that, historically speaking, this was a very important snapshot, but I feel like I didn't really get to know Lincoln better through this film, especially having watched a few things recently like Hidden Figures, The Help, and other movies that, you know, were dealing with racism and the oppression of African Americans. I feel like a lot of movies have aged in a way that I can tell that people are trying to relieve themselves of white guilt. That really stuck out to me. It felt like you have to have your group of white folks that had their uh, reasoning in place back then and were ahead of their time and knew that this was an outrageous thing. But the truth is a lot of people supported slavery. And I thought that the reason for why Lincoln especially pushed the 13th Amendment was for economical reasons. So I definitely wanted to pick your brain to find out if that was true and if the movie maybe embellished a bit of his compassion for black folks. And was he really bothered by slavery or was this really an economic decision? Lincoln historically was bothered by slavery. 
That is well noted. You can find that um, documented not only in correspondence between Lincoln and uh, whether it be friends or other congressmen or whoever it may be. Lincoln did not did not like the the idea of slavery. Obvious and. I almost said obviously. It's not obvious to everyone, but uh, it, it, it's a tough one. It's tough because people are still conflicted to this day. What really was the what caused the Civil War? When most historians with a brain know it was the root cause was slavery. People try to connect it with with states' rights, and that's certainly in it. That's a certainly in the conversation. But what is it? The states' rights to own slaves. And then as time went on, Lincoln connected the end of the war with the end of slavery. So I, I think what happens is over time, it just became more, he, he started to believe more in it. He had more belief in it. He wanted to unify the country, but he wanted that part of our history to end. And it was just obviously getting the votes for that and, um, and overall public support, because like you had pointed out, uh, there were a lot of people who supported slavery. I mean, had the South ripped themselves from the country to keep it. So that's a whole chunk of our nation, and it was a very, a very tough time indeed. But I do agree that we should have got more of Lincoln, except that is, you know, that little bit at the end there. You know, the four months. Uh, despite the importance of those four months, people want to know more. You know, learn more about Lincoln. And but Steven Spielberg did say that it, he just couldn't fit it. The book that he based uh, the movie off of, um, he said it was too big in his own words. The book was way too big for. A movie and so he adjusted but if you're wondering if it was like simply just so, like something a politician's promising to get the votes and, and the people support it wasn't that at least from the evidence that we have available to us today it was more of a he was genuinely interested by by the end of the civil war his genuine interest was ending slavery and bringing the country together See, now, the um, the scope of the movie takes place, like you said, over this four months. I really appreciated that they narrowed the scope of time that they were looking at because I think everybody gets kind of a broad strokes overview of Lincoln. And very rarely do we get something more in depth about the political climate, about what was going on at that time in that place. And... Mm -hmm. While I understand that some people didn't appreciate that decision, for me personally, I did appreciate that decision because I know that L is not really into the politics of it all, but yeah. I found it fascinating uh, to see all the different ways that people were moving and what their influences were. You know, everything else aside, I think that was a really good decision. You get a, a look into the hallways of Congress, in a sense, uh, because it's not much different today than it was in 1865 in terms of Congress and lawmakers and getting the vote for this bill or getting the vote for that bill. It's, it's just as shady today as it was back then. Um, but obviously, back then, it was much easier to be shady uh, because of the times. But there were promises that had to be made. There were favors that had to be, you know, uh, granted. Whatever you had to do to get those votes, it was nice to see that, to see what's going on, the inner, the, the workings of the system. Yeah, I definitely found so much comparing to today's politics and the way that there is such a division between Democrats and, and Republicans, except that the ideology was flipped back then and most Southerners were apparently Democratic and really all, pro... All, all Southerners. Right, <laughs> right, and pro-slavery that obviously shifted at some point, but it was hard for my brain to reconcile today's politics with what was going on in this movie, and I was like, right, the Democrats are the Southern. Like, I had to constantly do that so that I could stay in tune with what was going on. And yeah. I understand that they were fetching votes and definitely, like, it reminds me of, you know, looking back at, like, crimes and how they were committed. It was so easy to get away with lying and and everything because well, now you can't, right? Like, now there's an email, there's a text, there's a some, you know, there's something that yeah. is always going to point to some shady behavior. But back then, it was so easy to be like, hey, we need your vote. We'll make you, you know, a congressman or whatever you want, but you need to vote this. It's still the same in a lot of ways. You know, it, the, the, the way the machine runs, it, it not much changes. You know, technology changes and the times change, but 
that hustle, you know, that, that, that shrewdness, the, it's been there since before Lincoln's time in Congress. Well, I, that kind of leads into a question I had for you, John, which is that uh, there's like really the entire movie is about the political maneuvering required in order to secure enough votes to pass the 13th Amendment, which requires a two thirds vote by the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And they had people abstaining from the vote, which declines the total amount and changes the the actual number that meets that two thirds of the House. And you had people voting yes and people voting no. And is this all true? Is that really how this came to pass? And, And did Lincoln delay peace negotiations with the South in order to pass the amendment? Let's start with the first part. I decided to get the top Lincoln biographers, uh, Ronald C. White. He had reviewed this movie when it first came out back in 2012, and he was asked all the questions that you you guys have and, and, and the listeners have. He's the go-to guy for Lincoln, uh, Lincoln facts. So they asked him about, the, for example, the over-the-top drama of the House debates in the film that you see. The top Lincoln biographer said, quote, you don't hear anything in the house anymore. You only hear someone giving an address for C-SPAN. I mean, one of the wonderful parts of the movie is that all of them are there. They're listening. Some of them are going to be persuaded. It suggests an earlier time of a much more active Congress. And it was that close. Uh, the, the, the vote, as you see in the movie, it only passed by two votes, I believe, passing by a margin of two votes. That was real life. Mm-hmm. And it, because... There was a lot of persuading to do. See, at the time, you had the Republicans and you had the Democrats, and then you had radical Republicans. And that's in the movie is what Lincoln is trying to do. Those are the people he's trying to deal with, the radical Republicans, who were opposed to slavery. They wanted extra stuff. Like, for example, they didn't want the South to uh, have any peace negotiations. They wanted the South to surrender and get punished. That that was what the radical Republicans wanted which is why it it took all this craziness throughout the movie to to secure the votes, to finally get it passed. And the lead radical Republican in the movie, Thaddeus Stevens, he was the main proponent. And it's interesting that they touch on his relationship in the movie. He, I, I think, with his housekeeper, who was biracial, that shows you that like a man like Thaddeus Stevens, this was personal for him. But he also argued that the, the, the slaves would be free, but not fully equal. So there was so many little things that Lincoln couldn't just go with when it came to the radical Republicans. Uh, uh, to end the war, peace negotiations, uh, giving terms is the best thing. But when you're a radical, you you want it. You want to just crush them and punish them. And we've seen later in later history, World War One, for example, what happens when you punish a country or a opponent severely uh, for a war. They turn around and do a start a second world war. Yeah. So you know it's just a uh, yeah uh, that was very long winded. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. Oppre- yeah. In other words, oppression is never really sexy, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's, it's not. It's it's really not. And and people were realizing at the time that even though, as we know, you know, just because we're talking about the end of slavery, but of course, uh, black Americans didn't get full rights for years and years and years Mm -hmm. to come into the 60s, 70s. Some argue even to today, but I'm not one to argue to today's point. But up to the 60s and 70s, for sure, even they were still fighting. The starting point was to end slavery. And that was the, once you end that institution, everything else can be fixed, even if it takes way too many years to do so. Yeah. Do you think that Stevens did really believe in the equality of black people? Because it seemed like he struggled in this movie and he wanted to push more, but they told him you lose the war if you don't give into this battle. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, since we know historically that Stevens was involved with a biracial woman and that that means that he had some personal stake in the whole slavery uh, discussion, even if he didn't want to admit it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think overall his portrayal in the movie was a good one because it's historically accurate. He he was radical, but in this movie he's made to to be a hero in a sense. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones had played 
plays this role of Thaddeus Stevens, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. That's Uh, correct. Tommy Tommy Lee Jones plays Thaddeus Stevens, but then he had played another role in the past. But as another biographer uh, and historian says, we just simply, because it's a private relationship, because these are private thoughts, uh, even uh, thoughts on slavery, which, you know, a lot of people were outspoken about, but someone like Thaddeus Stevens, I don't think we'll ever know fully his views and thoughts, just what we have available for us. And the movie did do a good job of portraying his role in the whole uh, situation. I was really upset. I think it it upset me more as a woman. You know, we're brown, right, John? (laughs) We're brown and proud. But like as a woman, it was a little painful for me to watch this movie because when they made that that argument, you know, or that differentiation that, you know, under the law, like we're, you know, there's an equality there, but like, but really the races are not actually equal. It also, for me, spoke um, to the inequality of women. And I know that I believe that in the constitution that women are not actually viewed as equals to men. And they've never stated that essentially because of the reproduction rights. And so they they don't want us to be, you know, at that level. And people don't know that. People don't know that we actually don't constitutionally have equal rights to men. And so when I saw that whole scene play out, especially when the politicians were saying to each other, what's next? They're going to vote? women are gonna vote and then they'll do what you know they'll they'll participate in politics they'll get jobs like you know and i was just like (sighs) i like watching that scene was really painful for me and and like i said i think a lot of women they don't know that we're really these second class citizens when i hear all men are created equal i just include women automatically um if you're an american woman i include you because it should be all americans are created equal we're just gonna if we're gonna reword it uh, that way everyone's covered all American citizens are you know because that's what the constitution is connect it's for us it's our country uh, us as citizens uh, I guess it's the writings of the time if you think about it yeah, 1700s there weren't many men walk, running around saying let's get the women involved you know it's just that's just the reality of it you know but not to say that women did not have powerful roles they were just behind the scenes workers and that's and how I, I felt you know, a, yeah in the ear. That's how I felt about Sally Field's character. She seemed to be quite passionate and very vocal. Was she like that? Mary Todd Lincoln was a special lady, yes. Uh, <laughs> she was uh, She was like that, but you have to also remember that in this time period, women were considered fragile, uh, literally. That's the wording. And she had lost a son, she went through depression. She went through what they would they would call the woos of women, and it's you know depression, melancholy. She would you know grief, sadness, all that. She had a what is it? A, not a fortune teller. A, a seance in the White House to I've try heard to about know, that. speak to the dead. She had her life after Lincoln is sad as well. Uh, you know, ben, you know she goes downhill after his death, and um, yeah, she was his his rock. Usually when there's a strong man, there's a strong woman nearby. Uh, Not always, but usually. I can't say always because that would be, you know, preposterous. I I don't know know for sure. I don't want to say, oh, you know, and someone's like, oh, John, you're wrong. But but there were women like, you know, Martha Washington and Abigail Adams and other women who, because of their position, they could do something. Uh, And it's just been... For women, it's just been really that you're worth uh, the same respect as any other man if you can do X, Y, and Z. And thankfully, later on, we saw that for women uh, come about with voting and then their participation in World War One, which was limited, but by World War Two, it was a lot more uh, active. Women were a lot more active. And now to this, to this day, uh, women are very active, not only in the military, but there are women who run for president. There are women who are senators, etc. So, for women, I think women have uh, uh, come a long way, and it's a good thing. Uh, now we just need to fix the other issues we have going on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, 
the, the lingering issues we still have going on. The scene that stuck out to me quite a lot was the scene where her son, Robert, I believe, is yeah. he's home from like school break, but he wants to stop going to school. He wants to be in the war, which was very common for a lot of people up, in, I think, until the 60s to be really interested in fighting for their country. They had a deep nationalism. And and I think that's something that we're really like unfamiliar with now. But, you know, she's really upset that her son is interested in going to war and she's lost a son already and she's pissed and she's telling Lincoln about it. She seems very reasonable in her emotions, but he's just like, you're being hysterical and if you don't shut up, I'm going to put you in the madhouse. And I kind of wanted to know if that was like a legitimate threat. That was more for the movie, uh, for the the drama of the movie. And to also point out that, I think that was also to point out that Mary Todd Lincoln had already been viewed as going a little crazy mm. at, by that point in history. So when we're jumping into the movie in January, February, Robert Todd, he comes back around that time, February, and um, that's where we're starting it. So for those who are not aware of their uh, lives and their losses, you won't know that people thought she was a little loony or that she needed a little help, but she was fragile, etc. So I think that line, because Lincoln was not known to be like that. Um, I think it was more for drama. Okay. All right. Now, I think... We maybe have skipped over the possibly most important question about this movie. Was Lincoln portrayed by Daniel Day-Lewis in a way that is historically accurate? I was really happy to hear that his voice was higher pitched, which is something that I knew about Lincoln. I forget where I picked that up. But what about his mannerisms and you know it seems like he he speaks in like parables and quotes and everybody just shuts up and listens which seems like it would be a rare trait was any of that real was any of that true uh when it comes to daniel day lewis i'll give you my opinion uh first on him and then i can give you lincoln biographer what the hell's his name i should know it by now see <laughs> white I can give you Ronald C. White's opinion on on Daniel Day-Lewis as well. So my opinion was he was fantastic. Great casting for uh, Lincoln. And Steven Spielberg is usually good like that, Uh, especially when it comes to historical movies. Schindler's List, Mm -hmm. he did well there. So I thought personally that he had the mannerisms down, he had the, the body. I couldn't think of anyone else that could play Lincoln today, I would want Daniel Day-Lewis again. And that's important because you get someone who's a little off and that throws off the whole movie. You can't focus on the important part of the movie if you're throwing off like, this guy doesn't really look like Lincoln that much. Uh, man, like, if only. But I thought Daniel, Daniel Day-Lewis was great. And Lincoln biographer, <clears throat> Ronald C. White, he said, quote, I was very pleased with Daniel Day-Lewis's depiction of Lincoln. He does a delicate balance between the homely Lincoln, the the homespun Lincoln, and the high Lincoln of the second inaugural address. He walks like Lincoln, the way he puts his feet down one at a time. He talks like Lincoln, not the baritone voice of Disneyland, but the high tenor voice. Daniel Day-Lewis studied Lincoln intensely, and what comes out is a very accurate depiction of the spirit of the man. So I think the top biographer for Lincoln gives it two thumbs up and I give him two thumbs up on uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. Okay. I noticed a lot of, um, through the movie, a lot of attempts to hide the fact that he wasn't as tall as Lincoln. They had him sitting a lot, crouched a lot, laying down even. And then when he walked, it's like they made him... He was him, alone. They, they made him walk with such a hunch. And, and I wondered, maybe Lincoln was a little embarrassed of his height. I don't want to say he wasn't confident. So what you see in Lincoln's physicality with Daniel Day-Lewis as Lincoln, is that was Lincoln. The lanky, sometimes not standing up straight, maybe a little bit hunched, all of it, the physical. If you if you just watch the movie and watch, and uh, on mute and you look at, and you study his physicality, you'll see what, what the Lincoln biographer means by the homespun Lincoln, the homely Lincoln. You see it in his body, yes. Uh, and Daniel Day Lewis did a great job. Um, I'm pretty sure he probably he probably immersed himself deeply into this. Uh, probably lived it 24 seven. He's known for the that. The best actors I, I know do that. They become the character literally, and uh, 
but you could definitely with the body, everything, the standing, the sitting, he had the the body of Lincoln. It, that, yeah. that, it, that makes sense. But, definitely- but could he box? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, that's a great question. And I would have loved to see Daniel Day-Lewis try to do that. I think he would have been great. Right. Cause well, cause in case listeners don't know, Lincoln was like a really accomplished boxer, I think in Illinois where he was from. Yeah. But who were his competitors? Cause that really, <laughs> that really matters. If it's like these old guys in Congress, like. <laughs> no, no, he wasn't boxing as a politician. I, I believe it was before, while he was a lawyer or yeah. before he got to Congress. Yeah. It was his early days uh, in his youth when he was younger. Now remember this is a young, a younger Abraham Lincoln, not the one you saw in the movie. And he was a very tall man, which was not uh, normal for the time period. And I think a lot of people would think twice about messing with, with him. So, uh, yeah, he was a, he did some boxing that's, early on. That's how he won his cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Catch me outside the courthouse. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the way people spoke, because I know a lot of our records of people in this time is from their letters, when people have the time to compose their phrasing, and they're also from the legislation that's written. It seems that a lot of our primary sources from this era before really any vocal recordings were available were all from things that people had the time to think about and write down at their pace. And I wondered if that was maybe why some of the language spoken in this movie seemed untenably eloquent. Like, you couldn't expect someone to bust out this phrasing, or could you? What do you think? First, you are, you are correct. When it comes to our primary sources, we, we do rely a lot on letters, and a lot of a lot of different correspondence that were written. You have to remember, like people just spoke better. It was just a, <laughs> English language was appreciated. It was because think of it like this: there were a lot of people who couldn't read or write. So to read or write was a sign of an uh, educated, intelligent person, which meant more doors open for you now. You could read and write. That's why they didn't t- allow the, the enslaved to learn how to read or write because knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, so those who could read and write, they're not gonna, it's not gonna be some half-assed stuff you get. Even if it's a a letter talking about, I'm stopping by today for lunch, it's gonna be some nice words. Perhaps I might uh, come upon your home on the the hour of the noon so that we may sit and and have a delicate lunch and discuss the, 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 so whatever. It's <laughs> right, the current political they, they climate or something. More. They right. thought more of their words. That's what I see from the records, whether you look at a record from 1865, a letter from 1865, or a letter from World War I. It's just, you see a difference because the times changed, the talking changed. More and more people could read and write, so it stopped being this special thing. And because it stopped being this special thing, over time, the language changes. And now, for example, how many people you know today that write letters to each other still? Right, exactly. Yeah. How many people today can write scripts? That's very true. I actually can write calligraphy. I was trained you're, you're, growing you're a rarity. up. Yeah. You're a rarity. Even when I was in school, we had, in the mornings, they would give us uh, workbooks and it was script. And we would learn, uh, practice our script. And now I don't think they do that anymore. For, yeah. so they like, don't. I guess I haven't thought think. about it, but that's true. I haven't written in script in. Yes, right now, you can write your name in script. That's it. Most people. They only could write their name. But write me a paragraph in script or read a paragraph in script. The importance, it's just gone down. Yeah. And so then when you're sending a letter, it's, it's going to take you three months to get that damn letter. <laughs> <laughs> it better be good. I want you get to- lost in the mail. The mail system sucks today. Imagine in 1865. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's true. But I mean, I had to write down the phrase untenably eloquent two days ago. And and even now saying it back, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I, that's a hurdle. And, <laughs> and no, and it's true. And back then, you know, you didn't have spell check and shit. Like I would have been miserable because that oh, I like highly depend on it. And I'm an educated person, but to sound educated, I need some of my tools, you know? <laughs> I think with time, the the English language, it's become very lazy. I wish people still, you know, 
wrote, sent letters to each other. But, you know, technology changes all that. And so the need to be able to write in that way, eloquently, it's out the window. There's no, what's the point? Why do it if you don't need to? Text me, email me, call me. I can write you a letter, John. Yeah. I, send, <laughs> I would appreciate that. Send it but, in uh, postage yeah, and on the old way. something that's just the lost, old way. The lost art, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember having pen pals and stuff like that when mm-hmm. I was like growing up. Me Most too. people don't even write emails now. It's true. Yeah. Even the email has become an archaic sort of writing form. But I did find that the language was a little flowery for me in this movie, and I was feeling annoyed. And mostly it was because I felt like I was falling behind on the story. I had to pause. I I, I will admit, I had to pause it several times and look at Chris and go, what's happening right now? Because I had to explain what a Dixie crap was. There were a lot of moments where it was losing me, and I was like, I think this is what's happening. They need votes and blah, 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 you know, and, and catch up with him plot-wise because the language was so roundabout. And I can understand and appreciate that that was the expression of education back then, but I could also understand that, let's say, you're the president, and you're writing a literally a form, and this form might literally change history. This this little piece of paper will be judged in history many many years later, and so like the attention to detail there, it's understandable. So uh, different times. Lincoln mentions toward the end of the movie that he's thought about traveling west by rail, and that set off alarm bells for me because I thought I remembered somewhere hearing that Lincoln's body after death was taken west by railroad and people would come out and salute the train as it passed by. Mm -hmm. And was that actually an allusion to that occurring? It must have been because you are correct. Uh, When Lincoln did die, they had to transport his body to Springfield, his uh, hometown, Illinois. And it was, he had major stops in all, almost all the major cities along the way. Uh, New York City was one of them uh, and others as they traveled west toward uh, to Springfield. So yeah, I don't remember. Does the movie talk about his death dream? He was in a dream at some point and he said he saw like a ship or something like that. Okay, all right. So what they did was the, the whole thing looking west that, uh, you know, the, what, was it a dream he had that he was going west? He mentioned it, I think, when he was talking to Mary Todd shortly before he goes to Ford's Theater. Because he dreamt of his death. He had a dream about his death a few days before his death, which is documented. And he dreamt that basically what happened was he had a dream. He was at the White House and he went up to a soldier on on, uh, guard on duty. And he said, why is everyone mourning? Why is everyone sad? And the soldier said the president died. And it was... Seven or ten days later, he was killed. So he did He did have these dreams. In the beginning of the movie, you see him on a ship. And he used to have dreams before major events, they say. Um, if you actually Google it, uh, Lincoln and his dreams, there's just multiple, multiple articles just about him and his dreams. Mm. Uh, so I think what they did there was... Uh, the allusion to the West was to show us that he's having this feeling, oh, I'm going West... And then he ends up going west when he dies and they transport his body. But he did have dreams, uh, including the one in the beginning of the movie where he was on the ship and he's heading out. And he had a dream a few, a few days before his death of himself dying. Yeah, prophetic. What struck me, like, as a person that is having these kind of prophetic moments and these moments of, like, strong intuition, is just how little he protected himself. Because he seemed to allow any person, including black soldiers, like, any person to come up and talk to him and shoot the shit with him. And it reminds me of, like, the Wild West days, right? Like, when anybody would just shoot you you know, over an argument, right? Like they would just whip out their gun. And in fact, when one of these guys was trying to go get boats, somebody got so insulted that they took out one of their pistols. And and it just kind of struck me as like, why wouldn't you have a little bit of security around yourself or be a little bit more cautious, especially when you're doing something so provocative and revolutionary? Here, Here are the facts. The Secret Service didn't exist at that point. It was there was no presidential uh, protection. The night Lincoln was killed, his bodyguard was next door at the bar having a drink. 
So there was no secret service, uh, and the president was elected by the people for the people, and therefore the people should have access to the president. And so up to that point in history, you could walk up to the White House, walk through the front door, walk to the Oval Office, or at the time it wasn't the Oval Office, but his main office, it was very open. Every day people would line up at the White House to meet with the president. Uh, they had requests, they had, you saw one request there where the guy uh, was talking about the toll booth. Uh, he had a toll booth issue. Yeah. Him and his wife came and uh, Lincoln dealt with stupid shit like that almost every day. Yeah. yeah. But because, because we elected him, so we should have access to the president. And it made sense at the time until the war started and then there were threats against his life and there were po- uh, kidnapping plots against his life and the protection there should have been something in place but it wasn't and when the secret service was created it wasn't even for presidential protection it was for a uh, postal uh postal fraud or something like that uh, really? and then pretty much came became uh presidential protection but up to that point he had one guy with him the night he was killed and that guy was at the bar so it's like there he were must have felt in the bad. like such an asshole. <laughs> His bodyguard. Yeah, he definitely did feel like an asshole. He didn't get in much trouble, but he felt like an asshole. Wow. How could you not? He dropped the ball on that one. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so uh, on to or back to the way Lincoln spoke. Do we have any evidence that he spoke in the way that he's portrayed as speaking in this movie and that people would devote such rapt attention to everything he said? Another historian who chimed in on this movie, and when it comes to Lincoln as a storyteller, he says that the movie is 100% accurate. Lincoln was known to be a jokester. Lincoln was known... Yes, the the, the, the storytelling was Lincoln. Uh, We have examples of that uh, documentation. There's also a film that came out called Young Mr. Lincoln, and that film uh, did very well to show, you know, Lincoln's just ability to uh, get to the point. Usually he had a gift with words, which mm. is, I guess, one of the reasons why he was able to eventually become president. It's just if you think about, you know, the speeches he gave, for example, uh, whether it be the Gettysburg Address or the wording to the Emancipation Proclamation. It's just like he, he was a very smart man. Remember, this was a, a man who grew up dirt poor and uh, and was a reader loved to read books you know went to school had to walk whatever miles to school from the log cabin and you know it's just he valued education he valued so it was natural he became a lawyer someone who just speaks and, and that's their job to speak to defend and it worked out for him there as a lawyer and it, and it definitely worked out for him as president uh, but yes, he was known as definitely a storyteller, definitely uh, a jokester. And there are documents that we still have, you know, letters and stuff that, that show that. Yeah, he definitely seems to have a lot of charm. But it did strike me, like as you were talking about his educational background, how he himself didn't seem to consider himself educated or because when he's talking to his son, he was just like, you know, I don't have much in the way of education. And I was just like, but you're president and you were a lawyer. And how do you yeah. figure? <laughs> yeah, you know, of course, you know, because all great men of that time. And I guess today, if you, if you think about it, are not really today, not for me, but the educational institution you went to was a big deal. So, like, Lincoln knew that he didn't go off to no fancy colleges. He didn't have the money for this and that. When he said that to his son, he generally believed it. Like, he didn't think he was anything special uh, because he thought of his humble beginning. He thought of uh, of everything he went through to get to the White House. So it's like that that's one thing that just never changed with him. Like, he knew where he came from and he knew where he was going essentially i think this kind of reminds me of what you said earlier in terms of like the depiction of him i did feel like there were different personas on the screen at different times i definitely felt like there was that guy that was like a humble a humble Mm -hmm. family man 
And then he would get up in front of a crowd and his charismatic, like, charm and humor would come out and woo people. And, and then there were times where he was forceful. And, like, there were, there were moments where he looked really not confident in, like, the way that he sort of moved around. And, and that he looked like he was very clunky when he moved around. But then, like, he had these moments where he would get up and just, like, just suddenly move with this grace and with, like, like a snake-like appearance. Kind of like, you know, he had, like, curves to him when he moved. And it was really good acting. It definitely set apart, like, these different personas for me. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's why... Uh Daniel Day-Lewis received the praise from not only the top Lincoln biographer, but other historians as well uh, overall thought that Daniel Day-Lewis did great because he captured Lincoln. That was the one, that's the one thing that you could take away from the movie uh, is that you're getting as close to Lincoln as we're gonna get uh, in a movie form. Was he perfect? No, of course not, because this is a movie. So was, were there dramatic, a lot of dramatic, uh, uh, situations put in or wording put in, of course. But when it comes to the historical accuracy and things being changed, those are the important things, not changing history. They were on point with that, which was refreshing to see because, uh, you know, it could be always a hit and miss with a historical movie, uh, especially one about Lincoln and a, and a topic so sensitive as slavery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, was Lincoln, if you know, was he a uh, litigator? Like, what type of law did he practice? Was he actually speaking in open court, or was he doing, like, contract law or something? What he did was he started off his political career in the state legislature in Illinois. Then he was admitted to the the bar, which he passed, and moved to Springfield so he could begin uh, practicing law under uh, his wife's cousin, a man named John T. Stewart. He was actually a trial combatant uh, during cross-examinations and closing arguments. He was in the courtroom... And he had to do cross examinations. Uh, I would have loved to see that. Imagine having footage of that. Uh, a right? young Abe Lincoln cross examining a witness. Like, just knowing his mannerism as president and the way he moves, I'm sure it, was, it probably was very entertaining, which is why he was able to eventually move on from that role in not only the state legislature, but as a lawyer. But he eventually moved on to Congress as, you know, the House of Representatives. Oh, was that his progression to the presidency? Was House of Representatives? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was in the House of Representatives uh, for two years. About two wow. years. After that, he was like what they call a prairie lawyer, practicing law in Springfield. But it was uh, in Springfield. You have to remember, this is Springfield and this is Illinois. And it's not exactly as urban and, and developed as it was today. So you, you think of the prairie. Uh, out in the prairie, what do you see out in the prairie? It's all kind of cases. It's an outlaw on the run from this or this person doing this. And he just took all these cases on in, in that short amount of time between the House of Representatives and then when he jumped into uh, getting more into like uh, politics to eventually get, you know, like with his eye on the presidency. Hmm. But uh, law, you know, the House of Representatives. Yeah, he was in the, he was in the courtrooms and he, uh, he was a, a bona fide lawyer, yeah. Do you think there's any takeaways from the contentiousness that we see between North and South and even within the Republican Party at the time, just so divided, division upon division, and I imagine that the House floor was a lot more animated during this time than it was, you know, maybe 20 years before or 20 years after. And do you think there's any takeaways from the portrayal in this movie, from the history of that moment that apply to the division that we see in the country today? The first takeaway is obviously politics is as messy today as it is as it was 1865. 1865, they were dealing with a divided country. One half wanted slavery, one half didn't want it. And the Civil War, today we're dealing with one half of the country wanting one thing, one half of the country. It's still, we, we see a, it's still division with the party, Republican, Democrat. Seeing that politics doesn't change much, whether it's 1865 or 2024, you know, it's still a, a hustler's game at the end of the day. You need to get your votes in if you want to get that law passed or this law passed or whatever. You need to work with people that you don't like to get whatever passed. Um, and usually, you know, they've been able to do pretty well. 
uh, for the most part, it hasn't always been easy, obviously, from 1865 to now, you know, with Congress, Republicans, Democrats, all the different laws that have come about since then. Uh, anyone watching this movie today, particularly since this came out in 2012, uh, it's already, what, 12 years now, damn, but if you watch it today, you, I would say notice the similarities between politics then and now, and I would say notice that there's always going to be some type of division. Now, whether we can overcome it is the question, like they did in 1865. The, the amendment was passed, slavery was, was done with, but then there's the end of the Civil War and the Reconstruction years were a mess. Mm -hmm. So it's like, try to work together as best you can for the nation at the end of the day. I think they were back then fighting for the nation to keep our nation together, one nation, not a divided nation mm -hmm. of slave owners and not slave owners. We needed to keep it, it one nation and we did. And we, that, that message still applies today. We need to focus on being one nation of people instead of being divided. Because uh, division can and badly uh, see the American Civil War, for uh, example. Yeah, exactly. Now, we're recording in advance, but this episode comes out on President's Day. So happy President's Day, everybody. Yes, and my in, favorite day. In light, of, <laughs> in light of that holiday, I'm curious, who is your favorite president? that question <laughs> the answer is i really don't have a favorite I, a number one favorite um because it's just too hard for me personally so i always like to give a, a top uh, i'll give a, i like to give a three do like it my top three in no order basically and for me personally um and i know i know historians personally who would disagree agree with me but that's the beauty of this country we can agree and disagree with each other I'm going to go with uh, no particular order. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln, number one, because of obvious reasons. I'm going to say George Washington, number two, because he was number he was number one. He was the first, and he was the first president to to say, "I don't want to be king. This needs to end. Uh, there needs to be a limit mm -hmm. of how long I can serve." Mm -hmm. And that was that was a very important president, I feel, uh, for our our country. And number three, I'll give it to someone uh, more modern. There's reasons, but I'll, I'm going to go with John F. Kennedy uh, as, as a third. Doesn't mean that there aren't others who belong in that top three on my, but John F. Kennedy has always been a favorite of the American people. Maybe whether it's because he was handsome or Irish or Catholic. He wasn't he that was handsome. Whatever the reasoning, <laughs> uh, he's always been an American favorite. The Kennedy family has always been one that we've been obsessed with as Americans. And uh, so John F. Kennedy, I'll give you that. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and John F. Kennedy. All right, now let's see if I can do it. If if it sucks, we're going to cut it out. But I used to know all the presidents in order. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Phil Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson and Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland, McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden. Did I just do it? I, I, it sounded right to me. All right. Did you miss I'm gonna. You I'm were, totally gonna totally mess with the edit <laughs> and just switch around the president so that Chris looks like he's crazy. It starts with Johnson. <laughs> switch, switch a couple. It'd be like you'll have Chris saying, "Yeah, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was the first president." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting. That sounded, that sounded honestly uh, good to me. Uh, I was. Uh, I, I kept up with almost every name. I think I think you were good, but you, you should definitely, when you get a chance, run it back and see if you were. I think you were, though. I, I might have it. I learned yeah, that in ninth right. grade. So. It's all right. You, you got Cleveland twice, right? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Okay, then. All right. Yeah, I, it sounded good to me. All right. <laughs> now, who was the president that only lived for a few days or maybe a month as president, but he had pneumonia because he insisted on doing the traditional walk from the inauguration to the White House? Was that Taylor or Tyler? It's one of those. It was not John Tyler. It was. Um, all right. Luckily, it came right up. Um, William Henry Harrison. Who I think was legendary for having an enormous bathtub. I thought you were yeah. going to say penis. 
No, <laughs> no, no. That's that's Johnson. Ironically, <laughs> I wonder if the presidents like measure their penises and have like a record because guys are obsessed. Let's be honest. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> just to correct you, real Chris. Uh, yeah. Chris, um, yeah. it was Taft that was fat. Oh, Taft. Uh, you're right. You're right. So I have a question for both of you. What was your favorite moment in this Lincoln movie? I almost said something fucked up. <laughs> I, I, almost, I almost dead ass said when Lincoln got killed. <laughs> oh gosh. That's um, okay. If that's uh, your I, favorite. You, I'll let you guys go first. What were, you, what were, what were your favorite mo- uh, moments from the movie? I, I think going back to the way you describe the movement of Daniel Day-Lewis as Lincoln. There's a moment when he walks by himself down this hallway and I think it's evening and he just wants to be by himself and kind of ponder what's going on. I think I love the political maneuvering. I love courtroom drama is one of my favorite types of film. And there were, you know, it's like congressional courtroom drama is kind of how it appeared to me, but much more um, animated and contentious and, you know, reminded me of like a more modern House of Commons in, in England. And although I did like that stuff, just him and the way he moved, walking down, lost in his thoughts, walking down this corridor. I think if I had to pick a single moment that was my favorite, that was it. I really enjoyed the moment where he was speaking to the black woman. I wasn't sure if she was like a a servant or or housekeeper or something like that. I would imagine she'd have a position like that. But when, when he was talking to her, I felt like that was the most honest moment, especially because I felt like this was a little bit drenched in white guilt and trying to sort of rid themselves in that. All the people that worked on this, it felt like that there was kind of an agenda here. So, but the moment that he met with her and he said to her, you know, I don't really know how this is gonna play out once like everybody's suddenly free. I suppose I'll get used to you. And I thought to myself that that felt very honest because it felt like he was, yeah, uncomfortable with slavery, but perhaps not a hundred percent on board with the idea of equality between um, these two races and it felt like he was at least aware of his own implicit biases yeah I agree with you on that yeah it's uh remember like for us it's preposterous to think of some of slavery and be people being slaves but we never lived through that stuff but like when you're living through those times where it's a common thing you wake up in the morning and it's just you don't think twice about it that people are owned, you know, that that black people are slaves. And when he says, I'll get used to it, it's like, yeah, it shows he wasn't perfect. He wasn't this, the perfect champion uh, of black rights. That was never Lincoln. He did believe in the end of of slavery, but he would, like many other people of that time period, even people who were comfortable with uh, 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 abolishing slavery and all that, it's like uh it's just it's a life-changing thing in a sense you know so it's like one day this person is you just look at them as your your staff or no one just your servant and the next day you have to look at this person with some sort of respect it's not going to be snap slaves are free everyone's good blah 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 blah. we see that 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 doesn't happen at all so it's like it's something that everyone had to get used to whether you were fighting for slavery to keep it or fighting to end it either way either outcome it was going to be a life-changing situation mm-hmm. well said so what was your uh, favorite moment uh, i'm going to go with the end i liked how they when he dies and then they have you know you hear the second the words from the second inaugural address the words that they decided to end with with malice toward none with charity for all it's like, it's, it's forewarning what's to come. We should have given charity to the South after we beat them. Not, I'm not saying let them off the hook, but the way we treated them, you know, the, and the whole reconstruction situation that comes after this, it, it wasn't done well or correctly because A, the president who was supposed to do it was killed, and B, the jerk off who took over wasn't so great, so, So I thought it was a nice way to end the movie with those words because those who know what happens next know that there's not going to be a lot of charity for a long time. There's going to be a lot of malice and resentment until, you know, 
current days where, you know, finally from being president to being the first congressman or all the roles that black people have done uh, to this day, uh, first black millionaire, first this, that, that, they've come a, long, a very long way. Uh, and I think if Lincoln was here today, he'd be like, damn, we've come so far. When I was alive, they were property. And now look, at they have, they're humans just like us. Like, they're not nothing else. Like, we're all equal. Yeah, I mean, you're not that far away geographically from us. And one of the things that I like about living in New York, in this lower New York area, is I do feel a lot of that equality just in walking and riding the subway. You know, like, it doesn't matter what color you are. Everybody hates you. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. That's one of the, you know, one of the good things about areas like New York City, the big cities, you get the melting pot of people. So you're exposed to different uh, cultures and different colors and different uh, religions and all that. So that compared to someone, you know, who grows up maybe in the middle of America in a small town or something, they don't get that exposure. And so that's definitely one of the, the perks of being where we are located. Um, mm-hmm. We just get to see it all, and, and you're right. They all just hate us. It don't matter what color you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's time for us to rate this movie. So I'm going to throw it to you first, but we have to figure out what we're rating this out of. And I have a suggestion. See what you guys think. I think we should rate it out of Lincoln hats. I, I like that's, it. That's, a, that's good. Okay. So how many Lincoln hats would you give this movie, John? Uh, I forget. What was the most we can give? It's from one to five. One to five, okay. If I take into consideration the casting, um, casting, the historical accuracy, the topic of the movie itself, I'm going to give it, it's either four or five. I'm just trying to decide. Um, five is a perfect movie. You I know, can... that's why I'm trying to, I, you know, I'm going to go with four because nothing's perfect uh, in my eyes. Uh, you can do halves so. if you would like to do four and a half and split the difference. We do halves all the time. All right, you know what? I feel comfortable saying four and a half because a perfect movie, uh, a perfect Lincoln movie would have had zero historical accuracies. Uh, and that's not realistic, though. So I, I, in my uh, judging expertise, I'll give it four and a half uh, Lincoln hats. Okay, four and a half for John. How about you, L? I'm going to give it a two. <laughs> <laughs> I found the flowery language a little hard to get around. I was struggling. Oh, like really a two? The first, yeah. The, wow. first, the first half for me was really slow. It really picked up in certain scenes where he was like speaking with um, his wife or really upset and tra- frustrated and trying to convince people to get him the votes, like whatever means possible. So those were like the most engaging. I did enjoy the acting, the impersonation, and and certain things, but a lot of the time, I felt like I couldn't get into the courtroom drama because I was trying to decipher what people were saying, <laughs> and, and it, it really detracted. And then there was also the fact that historically, again, like Dems and Republicans were flipped, and so like my brain was just working way too hard. And maybe that's lazy of me, but just <laughs> enjoyment wise, it was really tough for me, and I have enjoyed other historical historical biopics more okay well for me i am gonna kind of draw a line in between you two i would give it three lincoln hats because i appreciated what they were doing more than i enjoyed it at times and at other times that anastasia you know kind of mentality of of not being in the moment, but being too much in the modern day looking back. I think it could have gotten another half to one Lincoln hat out of me if it didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I I appreciate that they had kind of a narrow historical focus. I like courtroom drama, so therefore congressional drama is not that far off. There was a lot that was potentially right for me, but the execution just didn't get me there. I will say there was one scene we didn't mention that really shocked me. Like, it was the scene where his son wants to go to war and Lincoln brings him towards, like, a hospital oh, or something. Yeah. And 
and his son um, sees like a carriage or like a wagon. It was like a wheelbarrow. Bleeding, right? Like a lot of blood being left, and then he realizes they uncover it and they throw a bunch of limbs into a pit. And he was so disgusted and just like um, he had a real like a visceral like a visceral reaction to. And I mean, even me just seeing all of those limbs flopping around like really gutted me just in that moment. But he still wanted to go to war. And for me, I thought that that was really accurate. Like it didn't matter how horrible that looked or that that could be his future. He was still, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid because that's how young men felt about their country back then. And I thought that was really well done. But yeah, unfortunately, I just didn't. I didn't overall enjoy the movie. Of course, I liked the most gruesome part. <laughs> <laughs> so four and a half, three and a half, two are our yeah. ratings, respectively. Yeah, and that's the only way you can learn whether you, you, you like something or not anyways. You got to watch it and then see, and then you find out, oh, this was for me. This was good. Or, eh, this was okay. Uh, but at least you got to watch it and, and gave it a chance. Because I totally get both of your points. You know, I'm just a history nerd, so I'm going <laughs> to soak it. You know, it's different when you're watching it from my eyes, obviously, compared to your eyes and everyone, because we're all different. But, yeah, I totally do get from both of your uh, perspectives, like, uh, with the language and then the whole anesthesia thing. I totally get that. I was one thing I wanted to ask, if they had focused on a different part, could they have made it more interesting? I think so. I that, really... I, not, not that this wasn't interesting in the sense that... Uh, the whole the, getting the 13th Amendment passed, that, that's very interesting and all that. But because we're given that, 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 that we're squeezing at the end of his life there, you know, they have to put this urgency in there. They have to put this, this feeling of rushness in there. And it's like, do you guys think that maybe if they had focused maybe at the beginning of the Civil War and what Lincoln was dealing with then, it would have been a better movie? Or like, uh, what do you think? I was disappointed with the fact that it wasn't a, like um, a more comprehensive tale of Lincoln. And for me, the reason why this particular story and movie didn't get a very high rating was because it got too lost in the political weeds. It just felt so granular what they were focusing on. The letter, the ink, the this, the that, the 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 meeting here with these particular guys like it just it felt like every single little step of this you know p time period was just analyzed and and for me it was just looking way too close at everything so i would have liked i like stories i'm addicted to stories so i would have loved to see him more as like that lawyer punching guys out in the courtroom like you know great, ascending to you know the presidency i his marriage his kids like i wanted to get to know more of him, I didn't. Fe I feel like I got snapshots, and and then it was all about this amendment and all the shade. I'm gonna agree. agree, but I'm gonna agree with a caveat, because I do wish that we had a movie that was more about Lincoln the man, pre-presidential Lincoln, boxer Lincoln, lawyer Lincoln. You know, I almost picture him as a lawyer, as like the uh, the the what was that show? Quinn, medicine woman, that, except he's a lawyer and he's he's roaming around the prairie lands and, and adjudicating, <laughs> you know, like I would really enjoy seeing that movie. But with the caveat that I don't want them to sprinkle in any seeds, any Easter eggs saying, you know, oh, look, he used this phrasing that was used later on in a bill that he wrote. No, I don't need that shit. <laughs> or like, oh, that man's going to do some great shit one day. Like I the, the typical holiday. Yeah, yeah, no, just tell me the story. Tell me the story yeah, of the guy. That, that Abe Lincoln, I think he's going places. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think he could be president one day. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, never, not, that, that skinny boxer? Nah. He'll never amount to anything. Then I think Chris is totally right. They were heavy-handed on being so aware of like how important this letter was going to be how important it was that the timing was right and there were so many moments yeah. like that that were like when we do stuff a lot of the times we don't know how things are going to pan out and very very rarely are we all waiting with our breath held for an outcome a lot of the times especially a lot of times a lot of people are very ignorant of the politics and just very ignorant of like what's going on around them like me I sometimes put myself under a big rock to ignore all 
all, especially all the chaos of today, I can imagine that a lot of people back then, the, the people that had real interest in whether or not this was happening were the Southerners that have all, all the things to gain from keeping slavery in place and black folks. Mm-hmm. Their fate was literally hinging on this. So, yeah, they they were waiting for this day and dreaming of freedom and everything. And so, like, I could totally understand that that moment was very important for them. Um, but, like, you know, like, for the northern guy that doesn't have a fucking any skin in the game, I, I can't imagine that everybody felt that passionate about this. Right. Well, you have to remember that there, not every soldier from the north was like, oh, we're fighting for to free the slaves. They didn't think of it that way. Most of them thought of it as we're fighting to preserve our, our union. Our, our country is in danger of being split in two and we need to preserve it. So like, yeah, for a lot of, of, of people fighting, it was more about patriotism and preserving the country. But then of course there were the people fighting simply just to end slavery. There were whites fighting simply just to end slavery. They were against it and they joined to fight. And then there were obviously black soldiers and Hispanic soldiers as well during the Civil War, I like to point out. And Mm -hmm. uh, as you were saying about how the Northerners that didn't have any skin in the game, like uh, the enslaved and the Southerners did. And that's right. So you you wonder, okay, so why the hell are they fighting then? Like, why did they... Uh, join the Union Army? Why did they, some fight against brother against brother? Why did some families have those situations? Why did people die? And it's uh, number one, patriotism, preserving our country. Number two, supporting our president and his decision was we need to end slavery. And if you were a good patriot and a good American at the time, you, even if you didn't agree with him, you have, you went along with it because that was the commander in chief. And uh, but it's different now. It's a lot different now um, than I've it noticed. was back then. Um, you, know, <laughs> as you, you guys saw you, that people just walked in. It was more intimate with the president. You, you could have an intimate connection with the president that you can't have today. The, the world's just different. You know, security threats and all that stuff. And there's just too many of us to freaking you know go hang out with the president. But. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, uh, I guess they just wanted to focus on the whole, you know, the bill and the slavery and the the inner workings of Congress, just to, I guess you could see what it really took in those frantic months, but they they could do better with a a Lincoln movie in terms of like his his story, like a better, because we know at the end of the day, we know that the slaves were free. Yeah. We know that the the Civil War ends, but let's learn, I I would like to see more of his youth, his growth, the House of Representatives and all that stuff, and the ladder up. Yeah. Yeah. You should write that movie. Yes. <laughs> I, I, that would be, yeah, definitely. I'm on board for this. I would come see your movie. Yeah. And we would, we would, you know, preemptively rate it five stars. Yeah. Wait, it was 2024, so we're going to have to, we're going to do a modern thing. A modern thing. I want a Hispanic as Mary Todd Lincoln. And a black man is Lincoln. I like it. All right. <laughs> so that's what we're getting, and that's it. Somebody but, uh, call yeah, Lin Manuel so, Miranda. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Make that sure. That's a very interesting movie. Now that you think about it, if you think about the way they do movies today, or they try to do movies today, they would mm-hmm. definitely like. Even in Hamilton, for example, they changed the character. There's a character in Hamilton named Hercules Mulligan. Yes. In the play, in the play, he's black, but he was not a black man. Right. He was an Irishman. Mm-hmm. So it's like you know they change things like that. So like imagine a Lincoln movie that Hollywood wanted to really go crazy with it. Look at Snow White, for example, and she's Hispanic now. Mm-hmm. Which doesn't make sense, but it's so. Snow Brown. Snow Brown. Hey, that's, Brown. that's the reality of today. That's what <laughs> Snow fucking looks like now. It's, it's whatever, but yeah, I I agree with. I do see both of your your views on the not negative, but the certainly the critical parts of the movie. You know, they focus. They should have focused it more for the common movie uh, viewer as well, because I felt like a lot of it. From me watching it, it's like you have to know a lot of this stuff, like mm-hmm. or stop it and Google it, or to really like get the movie like fully and understand what the hell's going on. Plus the t- 
type of language they're, they're, they're using, the flowery language that they're using. <laughs> using. <laughs> exactly. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for coming back, returning to our show to add uh, some historical validity to our nonsense. <laughs> Please plug yeah, your show. It's always my pleasure. <laughs> it's always my pleasure to come on anytime, guys, of course. You guys, you both know that. And uh, it's always fun for me. And uh Basically, if you guys want to find me, uh, Instagram hates me. I'm in Instagram jail right now, but you can what? find me at hittinghistorypod.com or Hitting History Pod on Instagram. I'd also like to say that my latest episode is out on uh, Staff Sergeant uh, from World War II, Lucian Adams, Hispanic Medal of Honor recipient. And for my side work, I have another history account that I'm trying to promote more. It's called Cold War Archives. Ooh. I cover events between the end of the Second World War and the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and everything in between. So that's between 1945 and 1991. And I just post everything that happened between then. And that's just basically what I'm, uh, what I'm doing, where, where I'm at. And uh, yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, we're definitely going to have to follow you because I'm pretty sure we're not following that history account. That's great. Thanks so much again. And Thank that'll do it. Me, always. That'll do it for today's spoiler alert. <laughs>